Welcome, everybody, to this World Forestry Week special event. For those of you who are not paying attention five minutes ago, or who were not here in the room, I'm Henry Bonsu, a British Ghanaian, based in London. I'm a television and radio broadcaster. And um, I was at the World Forestry Congress in Seoul um, a few months ago, and it's great to see some of you here again uh, today. So, those of you who were in the plenary, all morning and into the earlier afternoon. This is going to be what we call in radio a change of gear, different energy. Hopefully we're going to focus on sustainable wood and non-wood forest pro products, pathways to carbon neutral and resilient bioeconomy. So away from the technical language and all the arguments between the member states earlier, we're now going to try and get to the details of how people live their lives, especially in these forests and around the forests, when it comes to the products, when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to livelihoods. So that's what we're going to talk about over the next hour or so. A quick announcement about languages and interpretation. I will be speaking overwhelmingly on Anglais, of English, in Brufu, in English, okay? But for those of you who want to listen in one of the UN's six official languages, then of course you can do so. You should be used to this by now. Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. And the meeting will be recorded and made available after the meeting. So let's think about why we're holding this session in the framework of the eighth World Forestry Week, held under the title, Growing a Better Planet. So it's to provide participants and member uh, partner organizations with the chance to exchange, connect, and showcase best practices, and as I was saying, actions on the ground, and to contribute from the forest community to the global international debate on forestry and environmental issues. Right, so going down a bit deeper, we've all heard over the past couple of days, and because you're here, you know this already, about all the challenges we're facing from the climate crisis. We all want to build back better without destroying even more of the planet that we've managed to destroy thus far. So how are we going to do it? Well, we know about forestry and why it's important. Production, sustainable, and consumption of forest products is going to be key. We need to enhance the value of forests, but mitigate also against climate change and accelerate the achievement of multiple global goals. You'll hear about that in much more detail from our keynote speakers and from our panelists in a moment or two. So who do we have on stage and joining us remotely? Well, a Premier League, I would call it, of panelists. Those of you who know football, the world's global sport, you have the Premier League, you have Serie A, you have the Bundesliga, if you're in Germany. We're talking about the very, very top level. Right, so we've got some really, really good experts here they're going to showcase good practices from across uh, the globe. We're going to highlight the transformative potential of sustainable production of consumption of wood and non-wood forest production. So we'll get some examples in just a moment. But first to our uh, initial speaker, who is Madame Ismahan Elouafi, Fowles Chief Scientist. A bit of background first of all, okay? So, um, from 2012 until her appointment in FAO, two years ago, she was Director General at the International Centre for Biosaline Agriculture, based in the United Arab Emirates, and previously held senior scientific and leadership positions elsewhere. She's going to join us today online from Saudi Arabia. We look forward to hearing from her about how we can strengthen the sustainable use of wood in particular through making better use of research, we know a lot already, are we using it properly, and innovation, and to harvest their contribution to a more resilient and climate neutral economy, because we want to grow, but sustainably. So, Madame Elouafi, c'est à vous, the floor is yours, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us. And Madame. for taking me, putting me in the league group. Thank you very much. The Premier League. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Premier League. See, I, I'm not so much in football, so I'm, I'm learning with you how, how we say it properly. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, really a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, and pleasure really to, with, to be with your excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is really my pleasure today to open the special event on sustainable wood and non-wood forest product pathways to carbon neutral and resilient bioeconomies. The sustainable use of forest products contribute to forest conservation, enhances the value of forest contribution to rural and urban livelihoods and mitigate climate change. It therefore accelerates the achievement of the global forest goals and sustainable development goals for 2030, including zero hunger, as well as climate, land degradation, and biodiversity targets. Today's topic resonates very well with the team of the International Days of Forest celebrated earlier this year, forest and sustainable production and consumption. I had the privilege to moderate a high-level event of the International Day of the Forest in 2022, entitled, entitled Inspire the Future the role of forest in ensuring sustainable production and consumption at the Expo in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. The event was jointly organized by FAO, the International Union of Forest Research Organization, and the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences, and hosted by the Swedish Pavilion at Expo, a beautiful pavilion fully made out of wood. As you walk in, you feel like you are in a forest. The International Day of Forest underlines that forest sector is contributing significantly to achievement of SDG 12, responsible production and consumption, and other related SDGs. The event also acknowledged that there are trades off between ecology and economy in terms of goals related to climate, biodiversity, and land degradation. Globally, the forest sector generates green jobs for at least 33 million people. I want you really to remember the number, 33 million people. And forest products are used by billions of people across the globe. Today, only 25% of total mat material demand is met by biomass resources, including wood, while the reminder is fulfilled by non-renewable resources. This presents a fast opportunity for renewable forest products to contribute to the transition toward carbon neutral societies and build inclusive, resilient, sustainable economies. Ladies and gentlemen, science, technology and innovation plays a critical role in developing sustainable wood and non-wood forest Cities and communities are engines of innovation and provide new sustainable solutions and options to promote resource efficiency, opening opportunities to attract new capital and investment. We will soon hear, we will soon hear from Professor Schlenherber in his keynote, how wood can contribute as a renewable building material to this transformation towards sustainable bioeconomies. The local forest-based value chain also supports inclusive economic development. However, they need to be further strengthened by building trust and dialogue between stakeholders along the value chains and policymakers. It is also worth noting that sustainable wood offers solutions across several value chains, not only in construction, but also as furniture, as packaging, as renewable energy and as biomaterials and biochemicals, this is only few options among many. Moving forward, we need to work with scientists, partners with private sector and civil society, among others, to further increase the lifespan of wood product, to reduce waste through more efficient harvesting and more efficient processing, and to enhance the cascading use of forest products. At the same time, further efforts are needed to support creation of innovative new products, wood and trees, including textile, food, construction material, cosmetics, biochemical, bioplastics, and medicine. 
And also, we need more efforts to promote sustainable production and sustainable consumption of food products. Finally, we have the choice to use these sustainable materials every day. So let us choose sustainable wood and non-wood forest products. This is one of the actions we can take to sustainability, utilize the resources of our planet for a better production, a better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, which is the motto of FFO New Strategic Framework towards really transforming our agri-food system, including the forest product. Thank you very much for your attention and over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Eluafi, for this excellent introduction and apologies for the connection problems, but I can assure you that we heard the vast majority of what you said very clearly. And you got us off to a great start. Yes, sustainable wood does offer many solutions, but as you outlined from the figures you gave us, a lot more needs to be done to increase the lifespan, reduce waste, and enhance cascading use. I mean, you know, the potential of jobs, 33 million people, green jobs, and only 25% of material demand is met by biomass resources. The rest is produced differently. Okay, so let's move on, go deeper into this now. I'm going to introduce a short video on the bioeconomy that our colleagues at FAO have produced to give us a short overview on the topic. Please run the video. Forests are not just beautiful and vital ecosystems around the world. When managed sustainably, they also have the potential to help us improve the way we live. Foresters, scientists and businesses in Finland are all working to make wood the material of the future. Ja mitä kaikkea siitä tulevaisuudessa pystytään sitten tekemään puuraaka-aineesta, semmoisia asioita, mitkä ehkä tällä hetkellä tehdään jostain semmoisista raaka-aineista, jota ei, jotka ei ole uusiutuvista lähteistä peräisin. Scientists are developing ever more ingenious ways to use wood. At the cutting edge, nanotechnology is creating a new generation of materials. Artificial leather, biomedical devices and even electronics. Things you would never imagine could come from trees. Wood made into super durable panels called cross-laminated timber or CLT is also increasingly replacing concrete and steel in building construction. This is how we can move towards building carbon neutral homes, offices and schools. Providing housing to a growing population is a major challenge. Around 3 billion people will need new housing by 2030. Using sustainably produced wood as a carbon neutral material can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It can also create new jobs. And it can be a step forward towards a more sustainable circular economy. Wood fibers are also being used now to make lightweight biodegradable packaging. Nowadays we have quite a wide range of plastics in use in our, in our daily life and uh, it is an estimation that from 40 to 60 percent of that plastic could be easily replaced with wood-based solutions. As this Finnish company has shown, wood chips from sawmills can be turned into toilets, wash basins and bathtubs, eliminating the need for porcelain which requires superheated furnaces fed by gas or oil. Our carbon footprint of the manufacturing is almost zero and we get huge CO2 savings when replacing these traditional materials with the carbon neutral bio-based materials. Sustainably harvested wood is the way forward. It can help us to build the bioeconomy that we need for the planet's health and economic recovery. Very good. Well done to the FAO colleagues for putting that video together. One or two stats jumped out at me. Nearly 40 to 60% of plastics could be replaced by wood-based solutions. And uh, some people don't think that when things are made in wood, they look very nice. The, fish, the finish isn't very good. But that finish looked really nice, really good. Polished, and it could go out to the market. People might want to buy it. 
And that's what you need to do. You have to get the consumer to want to engage. There you go. And not feel they're losing something. But let's move on because it's now my pleasure to introduce a speaker who will further frame and set the scene for us today. Mr. Joachim Schnellenhuber is Director Emeritus of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, which he founded in 1992, so 30 years ago. He's also a distinguished visiting professor at Tsinghua University in China and a member of numerous learned societies. We're going to hear from him in just a moment or two. And he's been working intensively on the transformation of the built environment and the potential of wooden buildings as carbon sinks, absorbing the carbon. And he's co-founder of Bauhaus Earth. And those of you who know your history know about the Bauhaus movement of 100 years ago. And a member of the new European Bauhaus High Level Roundtable. So, Herr Schnellenhuber, we look forward to your reflections on how we can reconstruct our climate with forest products. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. We can. And uh, I'm very glad to join this seminar. Actually, I'm also glad to meet again at the distance uh, Ismahan because we were together in the Vatican precisely one year ago at the 4th of October, 2021. So I will try to share my screen with you and let me see. It's always a moment of tension, but I guess you can see my slide. Is that right? Can you see it, please? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Very clear. Yeah. Okay, in German. Thanks a lot. Auf Deutsch, aber jetzt auf Englisch bitte. So please now in English. Okay. Yeah, good, good. Going on in English. Okay. So the title is Reconstructing the Future, the Co-Transformation of Land Use and Urban Development. And as you said rightly, it's about the built environment, but the forestry uh, actually plays the crucial role here. And actually for all those people who have not recognized this, the forestry sector is actually the key sector to saving our climate and to saving the world, if you like. And I'm going to show you this right now. So we recently had Germany is hosting the G7 summits this year and in Potsdam, my hometown, we had a meeting for the first time, the ministers for urban development came together. I was asked to give a keynote about this. So you see me with Chancellor, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz here. And I gave actually, a, 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 in a way, a very similar talk using this reconstructing the future that the future will be decided in cities in a built environment. But as I said in my title slide, it's really the co-transformation of cities, of urban space and land use. And when we talk about land use, power of course is primarily concerned with food production and so on. But actually the products from forests, from trees, are extremely important, as I will show you now. So uh, uh, Japan will actually host the next G7, and they will continue this track for the ministers on the built environment. And actually, after my keynote, I was asked to go to Japan because it was picked up at the highest level, this theme of the built environment. So there will be a meeting in Tokyo with the emperor, with the prime minister, I was asked to give the keynote. And it's all about this co-transformation of the built environment and land use. So I'm going to show you, although time is short, but it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, a very impressive little movie. I show you how our culture, our civilization was built actually through cities. So this starts some 4,000 years before the modern era and goes into our time. So let me see whether it works, yes. So you will see flashing up, first in Mesopotamia, of course, uh, the first great cities. So if you see, you have uh, Uruk and Ur and others, and uh, uh, the first city of all was Eridu, by the way, when we had Memphis and Heliopolis in uh, Egypt. 
when you see the city is uh, sort of wandering towards uh, uh, Iran and when to India, you see the first city popping up in China. Uh, Troy was created and destroyed. You see cities appearing uh, in uh, Europe uh, and, uh, and in uh, the Americas, Carthage, Rome, actually. And with the Roman Empire, cities are moving towards uh, Europe, Northern Europe. London was just popping up. Now we go into the phase of uh, the late Roman Empire. You will see cities spreading all over uh, the old continents. If you like, Barcelona just popped up. Now we go towards the medieval climate optimum, uh, the 11th, 12th century. Lots of cities are being founded. And there is a certain stagnation uh, with the Little Ice Age. But now we go towards the Industrial Revolution, and now you see what is going to happen. You have a revolution, an explosion of urban space, actually. And what I try to demonstrate with this little movie is that unless we're able to tame in some way and to transform in a sustainable way this dynamical development on Earth, when we will lose all, all the wars against climate crisis, against biodiversity loss against uh, sort of shortage of food and so on. So that is my message. And the built environment in what we call the good Anthropocene, we have to transform from what I call the dumb, the stupid linear petroeconomy based on fossil fuels. We have to go towards what I would call a smart circular bioeconomy with a capital bio because the future sort of stuff from which civilization is made is all renewable biological regrowing. So since I am a climate scientist, uh, let me just remind you how the climate crisis is unfolding. So this is the famous Paris Agreement. Global warming has to be limited to well below two degrees. And actually, uh, there's a higher ambition level. Let's uh, restricted to less than 1.5 degrees. Uh, I'll comment on that in a minute, but first of all, why this two degrees? Well, this is based on what we developed as so-called tipping points, tipping elements theory in the climate system. These are the vital organs of the global environment. Uh, so you can pick your favorite, the tropical coral, coral reefs, the Amazon rainforest, uh, the Fermat line circulation, the Gulf Stream, the Great Ice Sheets. And I give you just two illustrations why it is important. So first of all, Greenland, the Greenland Ice Sheet, if it melts down, sea level rise globally will rise by seven meters. And then on the right hand corner, upper corner, you see that Greenland lost in 2019, one million tons of ice per minute. So this is an almost mind-boggling dynamics. And the second, which is a very, very worrying uh, uh, result uh, recently published in Nature, the tropical tree mortality has more or less doubled in the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, so the lifetime of tropical forest, even untouched ones, has, uh, has cut in half. And that has to do with the climate, changes, actually the changes in precipitation, in humidity, in uh, insulation and so on. This is a very, very uh, alarming result actually. Yeah. So it's not just keep the forest sort of protected, let nobody intrude the area, miners, whatever, farmers. No, you have a long distance influence on the tropical forest by climate change already. So this is the summary and where all these tipping elements could collapse. Uh, and I do not go into the details. You see the coral reefs would probably die back even with 1.5 degrees warming. Uh, Greenland, Western Arctic ice sheet are 
actually threatened by two degrees and so on. So we are in a very, very, very risky situation already. Yeah? And we have to desperately look for solutions. And of course, one part of the solution is renewable energies, carbon neutrality in energy production and so on. But this is not the full story. The other part of the story is related to land use and forestry. We have already 1.2 degrees warming, so we are very close to the first ambition level of the Paris Agreement. And this is a sketch actually of the situation we are in. So you see the timeline on the horizontal axis, uh, 1900 to 2200. Now this is historical evolution of the climate. So we have now already 1.2 degrees warming as I showed you. And under business as usual, this will happen. We will go far, far beyond the Paris red line, so to speak, two degrees and so on. Uh, I personally don't think we can hold the 1.5 degrees line. So this is the only realistic scenarios in my eyes and in the eyes of most of my colleagues that is overshoot. So try to stop global warming slightly above two degrees and then try to work yourself back over the next one, two centuries towards one degrees warming, but how can this be achieved? Huh? And it is achieved, as I will show you, so you need negative emissions. So there's a lot of talk about buildings for climate neutrality, but we need to be even climate positive. We need negative emissions, which means we need net extraction of historical CO2 from the atmosphere. And the IPCC thought, well, this can be done in particular through BECS, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. This will not work at scale. In my view, it will be too expensive. So there's a better solution. And the better solution is that we turn our cities, which are built now from steel and concrete and so on, and plastic and glass, into, yeah, if you like, constructed forests using timber in particular. You can also use bamboo, you can use all types of filling materials and so on, but it has to be bio-based. Huh? And you can show actually that you can remove tremendous amount of CO2 from the atmosphere if you turn our cities into built forests. And i uh, give you just the end of the calculation. So this is the, the plan to, uh, by logging and so on, you extract timber, uh, harvested biomass from the forest. Of course, you do immediate replanting of sustainable forestry. So you close the first loop and you build the houses and the infrastructures in a way that you can disassemble easily, so no toxic loose and so on. So you can use a timber element for free, five times whatever, uh, for centuries actually. And if you close both loops, you have something what I might call, or you might call the forest reconstruction farm to clean up the atmosphere. So I give you, I give you the end uh, of the calculation. And in order to restore the climate, that means to remove significant amounts of historic emissions, we have to all together add and support about 500 billion trees on this planet, and we have to build about 2 billion structures from harvested biomass. Huh? That will undo most of our historical emissions, actually. Yeah. This is the nature-based solution. And as you know, we have about almost a billion hectares of degraded land on this planet that could be used. We did a publication just recently in Nature Communications where we showed if, if you want to house additional 2 billion people, uh, world population is still growing based on uh, biomaterials, then you need about 200 million hectares of reforestations, reforestations, plantations, and so on. And when you see how the mix would look like in the year 2100 on the right hand side, it, 90% of these buildings would be built from timber or from wood or from hemp and other things. And there's a trade-off, of course. I mean, you use 
uh, degraded land and there's plenty of that around, but even more important is that you uh, have to change your land use in a way and actually there is one part which will be reduced in the future, needs to be reduced, that is pastures. Uh, so beef production has to be uh, reduced actually in favor of producing of production of timber here. Yeah. So let me conclude by reminding everybody that there was once about 100 years ago a revolution in architecture, design, urbanization that was the Bauhaus movement. And we now argue that we need a new Bauhaus movement. And this was picked up, for example, by Ursula von der Leyen. She declared the new European Bauhaus, which has to go global, of course, in the future. I have personally been involved in the establishment of the Bauhaus Earth. And it's all about the co-transformation of the built environment and land use, actually. Yeah. So we had a very nice conference at the Pontifical Academy, of which I am a member in Rome in June this year, and you see Ursula von der Leyen gave the keynote speech. We had the German minister, Clara Geiwitz, for the built environment. We had world-class architects, uh, uh, intellectuals, cardinals, and so on. It was a, a world-class event. And the idea was bringing together in the spirit of the Bauhaus as a, if you like, a Samtkunstwerk, all the sectors that need to bring about this co-transformation. Uh, final remark is we have fantastic tools available now, whether you want to do sustainable forest management or you want to build skyscrapers from timber, we can use advanced tools from digitalization. With uh, quantum computing, we will be even much, much better. So in the end, we will be able to bring together technology, the most advanced technology based on digitalization and natural material. And we called it, and this is the final statement of the Pontifical Academy on that workshop, it is about re-entanglement. And it means we bring together no tech, that is natural materials and high tech, that is advanced machine work. So that's all I wanted to say. It's an exciting story, but we have to hurry up because we have lost many, many years and the climate crisis will not wait for us. So hopefully FAO can make a very important contribution to this tra code transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Schnell and Huber. You gave us a history lesson, a fairly scary one. Um, if you look at the impact of the Anthropocene over the past how many 10,000 or so uh, years, uh, impact on our climate, the rise of the cities. I saw London came in, Londinium, very late in the day compared to the cities in uh, North Africa and uh, the Middle East. And if you consider how we began, um, we looked at possible desirable futures and the professor was telling us what will happen if we carry on as we are or if we don't adapt and mitigate enough, we're headed for a very undesirable future. I use that language because I've been spending a bit of time with futurists at the UNFCCC, the people who do the COPs, and uh, yeah, they're really hot on this now. All right, so we're going to have a special presentation now. It is the Forest Product Outlook Report. It's being launched today. It's brand new. I'm delighted to say I have Thais Linhares Juvenal, who is team leader, forest governance and economics at FAO. And Thais is going to do the presentation and launch the publication. Please come up. Now, if you know Thais, as I do, you will know she deserves more of a round of applause than that. Please. There you go. You see, Thais, people, wonderful. Okay, so Thais, could you please tell us what are the main messages of the report? Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. You're always uh, very good to speak, being cheered by you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a great honor to... That could be me. Let me get out of the way. It could be me. I'll go down. I think it's a great honor to be here and present the Global Forest Sector Outlook 2050, 
on behalf of our Deputy Director, Tina Bahane. Yeah. Thais, if, if you move away from the podium, perhaps you need to move away from the podium. I think, yes. Yes? I, I think so. I hope I am better in producing reports than dealing with mics. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Um, we are launching this new FAO working paper, which is a SOFO background paper that was used uh, for producing the SOFO 2022. And we are bringing up new evidence to support policy making uh, for a sustainable bioeconomy. Basically, we had two questions in mind. The first question is, what is the required production to sustainable supply future demand for wood products up to 2050 in a business as usual scenario and then in a bioeconomy scenario? So we have just heard presentations on about how we can increase the use of wood in construction, but what do we need to support this uh, transition sustainably? And also, what are the policies and investments that we need to ensure that this transition to a wood-based bioeconomy will happen? So I won't bring you a lot of data here because we have a very few time. You can go to the publication, but just a few highlights of what we have found. So just a very quick uh, look into the methodology. So basically we built a business as usual scenario using the global forest products model. It's a very uh, used uh, uh, model uh, for those working with projections in the forest sector. And uh, we built a bioeconomy scenario uh, 2050 based on the uh, consumption of two products which already have uh, a consolidated market, which is the mass timber and uh, the man-made cellulose uh, fiber, MMCF. What have we found? We found that on a business as usual scenario, the global consumption of primary processed wood products would increase by 37% until 2050. Eastern Asia will lead this expansion with a consumption of four, an increase of 41%. Uh, but the most, perhaps, uh, critical alert we have here is the role of Africa. We know that Africa is a big forest region. However, Af Africa today is already a net importer of wood products, and the consumption of wood products in Africa is lagging behind it's going to increase less than the, the projected growth in income and population. Uh, but then we come to the bioeconomy scenario. And what we see from the bioeconomy scenario is that we might be speaking of an increase between 98 to 272 million cubic meters triggered by the additional production of uh, um, mass timber and MMCF. So, uh, uh, it, and it can be an increase if we increase the use of these, uh, uh, of these products in the transition to a wood-based bioeconomy, this increase by be uh, uh, of 8 to 23 percent. The mass timber uh, is the, the most consolidated market, but we can see here that also the MMCF has an important uh, uh, percentage. Uh, the other uh, important question we had, what's going, what's going to happen wood, with wood energy? And wood energy, the situation is a little bit more uncertain. And when I say uncertain, it's because we have many different scenarios. We know that uh, the data on wood energy is much less reliable than for uh, uh, the other products. But we can say that uh, the increase, assessing all the scenarios, that the global consumption volumes of fewer wood 
from forests in 2050 may be between 2.3 billion and 2.7 uh, billion cubic meters uh, compared to what we had in 2020, which was 1.9 uh, billion cubic meters. So we also know that wood fuel will remain the main energy source for many households in emerging economies until 2050. But all the scenarios point out to some sort of uh, uh, slow down in the uh, 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 increasing rates. This means that we suppose that not far from 2050, the increasing consumption of wood fuel will peak. So what are the investments required to produce these primary processed woods to meet this future demand of 3.1 billion cubic meters in 2050? So it might amount to it may amount to 25 billion US dollars per annum from 2020 to 2050 to set up new production units and modernize the existing industries. Um, and this amount will be increasingly allocated in emerging economies. Additional investment required to produce mass timber and MMCF to substitute for non-renewable materials may be between 1.4 billion and 2.5 billion per annum. So it's a, a small percentage of the uh, increase of the already expected uh, investment increase. Um, providing the related industrial roundwood supply from forest plantations would require 1.4 uh, billion to 4.5 billion in investments per annum. So for anyone who understands how the forest industry works, if we have increasing investment in the industry, we have to have also uh, investment in the forest, and this is supposed to uh, amount to a bit something between 1.4 billion and 4.5 uh, billion. Um, increasing productivity in forestry and forest-based industry might mean a moderate increase in employment. And there are two main key messages here. Employment will increase, might increase, not much, but the quality, the type of the employment in forestry will change. We will have increasing productivity and we will need much more uh, skillful, skilled labor. We then require solid education and training to meet the transition to this uh, uh, wood-based bioeconomy. So, while naturally generated forests present a trend of stability, uh, that's the trend we have seen from the policies uh, uh, we had regarding this type of forests, we understand that then the supply of wood to meet the projected consumption will most likely come from planted forests. So, since uh, in a business as usual scenario, we would say that at least 33 million additional commercial plantations could be sufficient to meet the 2050 demand growth if the production from naturally regenerated forests remains stable, if 70% of residues are used as virgin wood fiber substitutes, uh, if the average productivity of forest plantations is substantially enhanced to meet 15 cubic meters a uh, hectare uh, per year, and if varying modalities of planted forests and production systems are in place. And here we are including uh, agroforestry. So what are our takeaway messages from uh, this publication? The first is that in a business as usual scenario, primary wood products consumption in 2020-2050 will grow more than the populational growth due to higher income in emerging world regions. That we also know that the bioeconomy scenario depends on the effectiveness of acceleration of decarbonization of economies. So it basically depends also on policies, how this is going to happen and whether it's going to happen. The study does not identify wood supply gaps. So, and this was our primary question. Will we have a wood supply gap? Uh, no. Uh, but signals that policies and productivity will shape the source of supply, 
naturally regenerated forests, planted forests, including plantations, and agroforestry, those will be uh, the sources. Proactive management of fuel wood resources is needed to meet the future demand of traditional wood fuel without compromising the sustainability of remaining ecosystems. So it, we need to tackle the issue of uh, uh, management of fuel wood. Forest ownership structures, business models supportive of inclusive forest development, private capital mobilization, and overall land use planning will be crucial. We need to think of land use, we need to think of uh, uh, the ownership and how to get the smallholders into forest production. Commercial objectives must be linked to forest sector development targets, restoration, climate change, sustainable growth. So we cannot think forestry in isolation. We cannot think forest production in isolation. Forest production needs to be integrated with the other uh, uh, forest policies and in particular forest restoration. In particular, thinking which kind of models uh, we will have uh, to uh, uh, provide this supply. Before I finish, I wanted to thank ITTO and Samsa Tekuro is here. This report is a collaboration with ITTO uh, and with Unique Consultancy. So I hope you can access the download the report today and uh, you will have much more uh, information uh, and findings there. Thank you very much. Can Thank I? you very much Can indeed. You do have permission to leave the stage. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. That was great, Thais. Thank you very much indeed. So that was your introduction to the Global Forest Sector Outlook 2050. The huge amount of stuff there, huge amount of information well worth dwelling on. Okay, so let's build on all of this, what we've heard thus far, um, with our panel. I did say we have a Premier League a panel of guest speakers this afternoon. They're going to share their experiences and perspectives. We, let us welcome, and some of them will be online, some here in the room, Hervé Martial Maidou, Executive Secretary of the Central African Forest Commission from Cameroon. Hervé Maidou. Ah, no, that's me. <laughs> Hervé, vous êtes là ou is he, is he remote? He's online, yeah, okay. We have Ross Hampton, I know Ross is here, Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Forest Products Association. That's Hervé. Bonjour, Hervé. We have Popisa Shola, Sola, Scientist, the National Resources Governance and Bioenergy Centre for International Forestry Research and World Agroforestry, C4 ICRAF. Posiso Sola, hello to you again. I remember you when we sat together in uh, Seoul, in Korea. And we have Shim Sadkuru, who is here, Executive Director of the International Tropical Timber Organization, which was a partner in the Global Forest Sector Outlook. So thank you very much. Give them a round of applause, please. And we also have... Janina Diane de Abru Sardinies. I know I've mashed up your name, I'm sorry about that. Associate Professor, University of Brasilia. Uh, the campus is Plant Altina in Brazil. Janaina, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. So they're all going to answer questions, which I'm going to put to them. I'm going to ask you to be as brief as you can in your replies because we are running significantly over and people have not yet had the chance to eat and I want them to feel nourished, sustainable and circular. Okay? Very good. If a human being can be circular, it may be possible. Right, okay. Hervé, I'm going to start off with you. I think you may be speaking in French or in Anglais. En français ou anglais, Hervé? Ok, je vais poser la question d'abord en, fr en, en anglais. En français. Je vais d'abord poser la question en anglais. Because um, I'm going to ask you the question in English. Please, can you elaborate briefly why forests matter for sustainable agri-food systems and livelihoods in Central Africa? Do you have your earphone? Do you speak French? Yeah. Will it do? Do you need? 
Avant que vous commencez, before you speak, before you commence, we need. La, la réponse. Maman, s'il vous plaît. Des instants, des instants. You need your interpretation, maman. Do we have the interpretation headsets? Yeah, I need to. Police speaker. Can you speak any French? We don't have it. Yeah, we can, we can, Henry, we can understand. It's not okay, you understand. Okay, yeah. C'est bon, c'est bon. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, yes, Hervé, allez-y, c'est à vous. Vous avez la parole. Oui. Nous avons environ 100 millions d'habitants qui dépendent directement des ressources forestières. Et comme vous le savez, nous avons nos communautés qui vivent à l'intérieur de forêts. Une fois qu'on enlève la forêt, ces communautés seront carrément démunies. Vous savez que nous sommes en pleine saison de pluie aujourd'hui et. et pour la COVID-PAC, euh, euh, nous sommes en train de travailler avec les différents partenaires pour euh, structurer les produits forestiers euh, non lieux de manière à pouvoir les valoriser euh, dans le cadre de convergence. Euh, et les produits forestiers non lieux euh, sont traités dans l'axe prioritaire de du plan de convergence en matière de valorisation des ressources euh, forestières. Et comme je le disais, une fois que la forêt n'existe plus, on ne pourrait plus assurer tout le bien que cette communauté euh, pourrait en profiter. Donc, lorsque nos communautés vont en forêt, ils font de la récolte. Ils n'abattent pas les arbres pour pouvoir récolter tout ce qui est champignons, chenilles, etc. Ils contribuent naturellement également à la déforestation évitée. Et je pense que c'est une manière durable de pouvoir gérer nos forêts. Nous avons travaillé beaucoup d'années avec certains partenaires pour essayer de faire une place dans les ministères parce que ce sont des ressources qui apportent beaucoup au, au niveau de nos économies nationales sans pour autant être comptées dans les PIB. C'est vraiment dommage. Nous sommes en train d'y aller tout doucement de manière à pouvoir intégrer les produits forestiers non ligneux euh, dans les systèmes institutionnels de nos organisations. Et également, euh, nous pensons renforcer euh, avec l'appui, hein, notamment on a travaillé beaucoup avec la FAO, à travers deux projets sous-régionaux déjà pour essayer d'organiser les filières d'Adalte, de manière à les rendre plus comptabilisables dans les économies nationales. Et donc, du coup, nous estimons que les présentations qui ont été faites tout à l'heure pour la transformation plus poussée, pour l'industrialisation, il serait souhaitable de pouvoir orienter quelques réflexions sur la transformation plus poussée des produits forestiers non ligneux afin de réduire l'impact des récoltes sur la destruction des forêts. Donc euh, voilà très rapidement comment est-ce que je peux dire euh, le rôle que jouent les produits forestiers non ligneux et le lien avec euh, la déforestation évitée. Merci. Monsieur Madhu, Madhu, thank you very much for your initial thoughts. It's very clear from what you said that uh, the forests are an integral part of uh, the economy and bioeconomy of um, Central Africa, particularly some of the countries that have been um, very concerned at the plenary earlier on, uh, like Cameroon and DR Congo. Let's move to Ross Hampton, who's been chief executive of the Australian Forest Products Association for nearly 10 years now, so you're, you've got a lot of skin in this game. Um, you started out as a journalist like I am, but uh, you're really deeply invested in this now, environmental protection, circular economy, climate change, and sustainable forest management. So I can ask you this, uh, what efforts is the private sector taking to foster sustainable wood value chains as a contribution to circular bioeconomy and climate neutrality because the private sector are often seen as the bad guys who just want ever higher growth yeah. consumption and, and you know mercantilism so over to you uh, uh, that's true henry but in fact um i'm actually the chair here too of the fao advisory committee on sustainable forest-based industries the interface 
uh, between the Director General and the private sector. And you're right what you say about the private sector and its involvement in this space. But um, you, in my view, we've got to turn that around. I mean, the private sector really should have Superman capes on. Because if we think about what has to happen here to save the world, we could talk for at length about all the things that our industries are doing to become more climate neutral themselves. But, but that's not the big picture. Electric forklifts, electric trucks, working with farmers to do a carbon neutral beef. But the really the big challenge here that Thais has laid out for us and the professor is to grow more timber in the world in a sustainable way that looks after all of these values. I mean, if we consider what was, what was just said about the built environment, do you know, the World Green Business Council says that the buildings from here to 2050 in cubic metres are going to equal pretty much the buildings from here back to the beginning of time. Wow. That's, that, that's what we're going through. And if we don't, as the Potsdam Institute has said, and as TIES and FAO has said, if we don't find a way to meet that growth sustainably, it will be met in a very carbon negative way. So I hope you don't think I'm putting, I'm putting on a, a, a carbon fiber based, you know, a, a, a <laughs> nanocellulose based uh, uniform here, because we have to work with the private sector. There's no way that governments and philanthropy can meet the demand. We have to find uh, the mechanisms, the new generation funding mechanisms that will grow more trees, uh, help ITTO in the, in, the net, in the tropical forests, help the Europeans with their work, uh, help Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, where we grow more straight rows of trees, do it in a way that is climate smart and, and environmentally friendly. But we have to do it urgently. Yeah, otherwise we face that dystopian future that Professor Schnellenhuber was uh, talking Correct. about. Let's go over to Dr. Fosiso Sola, who is um, a scientist at C4 ICRAF, working on natural resources, governance, bioenergy, and development of sustainable agroforestry value chains. And her current work focuses on governance of wood fuel. And she gave a very powerful presentation, I remember, in uh, Korea at the World Forestry Congress. So Dr. Sola, let me ask you, I mean, FAO estimates that half of the wood is extracted from forests and it's burnt and used as an energy source, something that you emphasize. It's the way people actually live in their tens of millions, particularly in uh, parts of Africa that you're very concerned about. So please elaborate on the importance of wood fuels for the livelihoods of these tens of millions of people. Uh, and also talk about the pathways to promote the sustainable use of wood energy. Because you said in Korea, we have to live in the real world, not in some fanciful notion of where people are at the moment. Dr. Sola, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. We can. Yeah. Really, the, the main challenge when it comes to energy is that people need energy for cooking and heating. I was just looking at some statistics uh, this morning that um, in 2006, about 86% of the world population had access to electricity and 13% didn't. And of that 13%, two thirds are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And energy has to be available. Clean energy has to be affordable. And at the moment, clean energy is not affordable for most people in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially. You find that between 2000 and 2020, most countries really, really increased their populations that have access to, to electricity and clean cooking. But countries in Sub-Saharan Africa actually increase the number of people that don't have access to clean cooking and clean energy because the pace of development of clean energy is not up to speed with the increase in population in Sub-Saharan Africa. So even if there is some development, but population is still increasing more than there is access to, to clean cooking. So really the challenge is how do you keep up with the, with the growing population to ensure that everyone is connected to, it, to the grid, everyone has access to LPG, and they can afford to be able to pay for the for, for the electricity bills and to be able to fill up um, the for LPG. 
the challenges with pandemics, most people have been falling into the low income status again and not being able to afford clean energy. The challenge that we have that I put out there is that wood energy is not going anywhere. We are not saying we want to replace wood energy. Transition is still a fallacy for most people and a long way coming. What we are saying is, can we reduce the proportion of wood fuel in the household budget? In most countries you have staking, people use different sources of energy for different kinds of meals and for boiling water. Can the government, the private sector come in to ensure that people have access to affordable and clean energy so as to reduce the amount of wood fuel in the household budget? One thing that we can do is really to make sure that wood fuel value chains are sustainable. We need to make sure we diversify and improve the feedstock that is used for wood energy, especially for charcoal. We need to make sure that the carbonization technologies actually are more efficient. We did a small study and we could increase the output of charcoal by 40%, but you need investment in better kills, appropriate kills that farmers can use, not one that will actually increase drudgery at the same time. You need to improve the cooking devices such that the less energy is being used in cooking. So we need cleaner cooking, cooking stoves, and cooking appliances that people can use. The challenge right now is that those apply, uh, cooking, the clean cooking stoves especially, they don't have a developed supply chain, they don't have a developed value chain. Once your, your stove breaks, you need to replace it. You can't have it fixed. And therefore people go back to unclean uh, cooking methodologies, which actually have more pressure to producing more wood fuel and more charcoal. So we really need to invest our money to invest in technologies from the production to the consumption to ensure that everyone can improve their livelihoods, they can cook their meals, they can improve the, uh, their nutrition, they can reduce diseases by boiling their water. For okay. now, I'll stop there. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much indeed, <laughs> Dr. Sola, for giving us the picture on the ground and the gap between the aims and the ideals and how people are really living in their tens of millions. Well, let's go to Latin America now because we have Professor Jinaina Diane de Abru Sardinis, who works as a professor at the University of Brasilia. Her main research topics include family farming organizations, non-timber forest products, and socio-biodiversity value chains, mainly in the Amazon and Cerrado biomes. So, Professor, thank you very much for joining us. Um, so let's talk about this. Here's a figure. 50,000 wild species used worldwide for food, for medicine, energy, income, cultural identity, and other practices, supporting half the world's population and about 70% of the world's poor. So here's the question. I mean, you've been involved in the thematic assessment of sustainable use of wild species of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, big title. Question is this, what are the key findings of this assessment? And coming from Brazil, how do you see the relevance for non-wood forest products when we're talking about sustainable development in your region? Over to you, Professor Janine. Thank you, Henri, for the perfect uh, pronunciation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and uh, good morning. Uh, also, because I'm speaking from Belém in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, first of all, uh, in the IPBES report, it's understood that uh, wild species doesn't imply a complete absence of uh, human management. And various intermediate states and domesticated species are recognized, but introduced populations are excluded in the report. So considering uh, especially non-wood forest products, the key findings are that uh, wild plants, uh, as well as algae and fungi, provide food, nutritional diversity and income for one in five people around the world, uh, in, particular the, in particular women, children, landless farmers and others in vulnerable situations. People in vulnerable situations are often most reliant on wild species and are most likely to benefit from more sustainable forms of use of wild species to secure their livelihoods. 
So uh, the potential contributions for uh, sustainable use of wild species uh, to meeting the uh, sustainable development goals, for example, they are substantial, but largely overlooked. Uh, in Europe, for example, the value of non-wood forest product is estimated in 23 uh, billion US dollars per year. And in other countries, as in Latin America and the Caribbean, many of these products are invisible in national accounts. And where is the importance of policies for statistical surveys? Uh, one of the biggest challenges when we talk about non-wood forest products also associated to informality. Uh, gathering is often assumed to be an activity more prevalent in the global south. Uh, and however, estimates of individuals and households uh, that uh, participate in gathering in Europe and North America uh, range from 4 to 68% with the highest rates of gathering by household in Eastern Europe, often regardless of economic status. Uh, and for some regions, uh, policies uh, to give greater visibility to the production of non-wood forest products and formalization of the actors involved in the value chain are uh, as more relevant for them for agriculture activities, for example, especially if we consider the need to, to conserve biodiversity, vegetation and other native areas need to be standing. And that is why we need policies to support the financing of non-wood forest products value chains to improve livelihoods of indigenous peoples and rural communities who depend on this resource as building capacities on sustainable harvesting, practice and processing, including on quality and safety standards, as uh, Thais Juvenal told earlier. Um, and uh, concerning uh, examples of recent experience that confirm the relevance of non-wood forest products for local and regional sustainable development in Latin America and the Caribbean, where Brazil is situated, uh, we can mention uh, the case of Brazil and other countries in our region. For example, of seed collections and commercialization for restoration and inclusion uh, in agroforestry systems to contribute to the diversity of local uh, production systems, uh, such as the Shingu seed networks and other recent created. We, we have this in the report, which has uh, the participation of indigenous and local communities. Also in many regions of Brazil, we have a list of more than 30 non-wood forest products that we call socio-biodiversity products, uh, most of them fruits, with a high level of nutrients and other important properties being uh, bought for school meals, not to mention an increase uh, in demand for other industries such as cosmetics, most of them with forest and fair trade certification. Uh, conservation units for sustainable use and implementation of processing units related to collective organizations such as associations and cooperatives uh, are increasing participation in national and international funds, public and private, uh, to promote non-wood forest products uh, value chains in inclusive uh, bioeconomy. Um, other chain uh, uh, challenges uh, can be mentioned in this case, such as climate change that will affect future of uh, wild species, both negatively uh, when making possible resource exploitation more intensively and affecting positively technology uh, enhanced monitoring, surveillance and enforcement. Professor, so meeting these cha challenges, to, yes? Professor, I'm going to take advantage of yes. your breath there to intervene and say that we are running over time and yes, um, interpretation, answer, interpretation will left, stop yes. in 10 minutes. Interpretation will stop okay, in 10 minutes, you. which means yes. we don't have much time at all. So please, please conclude okay, your remarks. Thank you for your attention. Was the last phrase. Thank right. you for your attention. Thank, thank you, you very much, very much indeed. <laughs> and now we move to the executive director of the International Tropical Timber Organization, which is a key role in this session, um, Ms. Sham. Sham. Thank you, Sadhguru. So Shami is the executive director and you took office in February this year and before that you were the ITTO's director for operations. You've got lots of experience in international law and trade negotiations, collaboration, etc. So um, I would like to know, I mean, we've, we've seen a snapshot 
of the forest product outlook and those important trends. Um, but uh, your take-home messages from this study, what are they and what's your outlook for the sector in the years to come? Thank you for that question, Henry. And first of all, can I thank the organizers of this event for the privilege of being here to talk to all of you. And I can only say that I have to very much agree with the outlook, uh, mm, with the content of the yeah. outlook study naturally because I did your partner at FAO in producing that report. Now, in terms of what tropical forestry can do, I'm sure everybody is aware that tropical forests constitute 45% of global forest areas. And ITTO as an organization, we actually cover, or our members cover, 74 members, 50-50 divide between producers and consumers, our members account for 90% of the international trade in wood products. Mm. Now that's big, that's big. Now, again, thank you to all the keynote speakers today and Thais and, of course, our very distinguished panel members for their inputs to this conversation. And I can only highlight a couple of key items which I think would constitute my outlook for what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Number one, the interface between government policy and the private sector needs to be accelerated ASAP. We have heard how urgent the situation is. We must act fast, we must act now. Private sector cannot act on its own, neither can government policy implement itself on its own. Number two, in order to accelerate this process, private sector need fiscal and non-fiscal incentives. They need to understand what is it that brings them the value. We have private sector in developed nations that have been involved in such efforts for more than four decades, perhaps. Mm. But the private sector in developing countries, they are reasonably new mm. to the big thinking. I'm not saying that they're behind. Yeah? We have a number of big producing countries, for example, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the smaller ones like Gabon, our African member countries, Thailand, the Mekong Basin, they're all catching up. But they need a clear way forward in how to accelerate this. The next thing is, I think, what needs to be focused upon by all of us, which includes government, which includes all stakeholders and audiences, it includes the private sector, the interface between forests and climate change. We lie central. We lie central to climate change challenges. We hear so much about people talking about how important forests are and how important our stakeholder audiences are, which includes, of course, indigenous people, local communities, women, youth. I'm not excluding men and everybody else. I'm saying in addition to. Let's not forget 10% of the world population lives in extreme poverty. Due to the current global challenges, I will not go into what they are. We all know what they are post-COVID, and also the current instability that we are all currently facing. My fear is that this will impact on the levels of deforestation, which in my view, we had peaked. We had peaked and we had reached and we had then reduced the rates of deforestation. If anything impacts on that increase, rate of deforestation in the five years to come, it'll be due to the current situation that we are in now. And that rate of deforestation will not just be in the tropics. It will also be in developed countries. We are already seeing the repercussions where rates of felling, the rates of industrial production is increasing. Sure, planted forests are the way to go, but let's not forget many developing countries still rely on their natural forest resources also for revenue and income. Wood fuel use, hmm, that can also change dramatically in the next few years due to the energy crisis and the prices. The affordability, as one of our panel members mentioned earlier, is so important. And ITTO has implemented more than 1,200 projects on the ground. They are all on the website. Please take a look at the wonderful work and the wonderful achievements that an organization like ITTO can help everyone with. We have even implemented projects on decarbonized carbon, decarbonized charcoal, sorry, enriching the livelihoods of women in Africa by introducing carbon clean cooking utensils, methods of cooking, and it's more the production of the decarbonized charcoal that should be of interest in terms of wood fuel consumption. I think I may have said enough, 
But I would like to hear from anyone in this audience who can tell me what happens with the 20 billion promised by developed nations under the Paris Agreement. How much of that goes into forestry, actually, or into supporting forestry? I don't know. Well, so I'll stop there. Oh, I, you. I tell you, Sham, <laughs> that will have to be left hanging as a rhetorical question, right. not to be answered no, no, not because really. of time constraints. Normally, I would open it up to questions from the floor. We don't have time, sadly. Um, we're going to go to a final uh, comment in a moment from the director of the United Nations Forum on Forest Secretariat, who is here, Madame Juliette Biao Kudeng Okpu, um, who is here. But in a moment, we'll go to you. Uh, you th yes, there you are. But very quickly from our, our panelists, Hervé, in less than one minute, which policy action would you like to highlight which is relevant to the COFO discussions and necessary to scale up the sustainable use of wood and non-wood forest products? I have to ask you in less than one minute, please. Hervé. Merci beaucoup. Très rapidement, c'est comme je le disais, il faut intervenir pour améliorer la production, les différentes chaînes de valeur pour les produits forestiers non ligneux. Aujourd'hui, nous pouvons aller même au niveau de la certification, pourquoi pas, de ce produit forestier non ligneux pour garantir vraiment une gestion durable. Et pour cela, il faut des investissements. Nous avons besoin d'investissements, mais concrets, dans le cadre. Vous avez parlé des financements annoncés à Glasgow pour la protection durable des forêts. Nous sommes en attente et sans euh, détail euh, justement sur ces fonds qui ont été annoncés. Pourtant, nous menons des discussions tout le temps avec euh, la communauté de donateurs pour savoir euh, quelle est vraiment la répartition de ces fonds réellement. Et pour les bassins du Congo, euh, je crois que nous faisons partie des forêts tropicales. Et il est indéniable que nos, nos partenaires puissent à chaque fois lorsqu'ils prennent des décisions, clarifier quels sont les moyens de mobilisation de ces fonds, parce que nous sommes à un an déjà et nous n'avons pas vu l'image de ces fonds annoncés à Glasgow. Okay. Ça, c'est le premier point. Le deuxième premier point, point, il n'y aura je... pas de deuxième point parce qu'il faut finir. There's no second okay, point. Hervé, finir. Merci. Il n'y a pas de deuxième point. Merci. Ok, <laughs> ok, alors le premier point. Non, pas de premier, <laughs> deuxième point. Merci quand même. <laughs> ok, pour votre bonne humeur. Ok, now on to you, Ross. So, similar question. Key policy action you think is crucial? I think it's pretty simple. Uh, Henry, we have to lay out the welcome mat, and, and that happens when governments, and we're seeing this at COP27, hopefully, there was an announcement by Alex Sharma and John Kerry and Prime Minister Trudeau and others, that at COP27, we're going to have the beginnings of a pledge around sustainable supply to go with the pledges around avoiding deforestation and all the other great things we want to do, biodiversity. We have to talk about them equally, put out the welcome mat and ask private sector into the conversation then say, you know, the parameters of it. It's going to be different in different parts of the world. On time and on budget. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, Posisa Sola, uh, doctor, your thoughts, please. A key policy action. First of all, would you really make its way into any policy document if you look at them? But I'll still say that I think with all the investments going into afforestation and restoration, uh, uh, AFR 100 and so on, all those policies geared towards that direction, how much of that is actually trying to address sustainable wood fuel supply? That would be my challenge. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Professor Genaina in Brazil, your key policy action. Well, just to be brief, uh, uh, policy instruments and tools are most successful when we tailor them to the social and ecological context of the use of wild species and to support fairness, rights and equity, and uh, recognizing and embedding uh, indigenous and uh, local knowledge into education systems uh, to support uh, sustainable use of wild species. 
uh, education and outreach, uh, they remain under Elizabeth's policy options. And uh, aligning national education policies with those for sustainable use can enhance sustainable use of wild species. We had a, another meeting concerning IPBES uh, results, uh, the summary, and we, we, we talked about uh, the education uh, um, part in the, in, the, in the drivers for sustainable uh, use of wild species. That's it. Thank you and sorry for taking long. Uh, that's here. okay. That's okay. Thank you. It was great content. It's just that we didn't have enough time to go further. Thank you. And finally, for now, uh, Sham Satkuru. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. I would say I would call for the investment in all forest resources because they are the most effective and efficient way of meeting nature-based solutions in the face of climate change challenges. Quick, fast, big. We need to move. Thank you. You've moved. You weren't big, but you're quick and you're fast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you to everybody else. <laughs> and now, uh, briefly, I would like to give the floor, because we're going to wrap up very shortly, to Madame Juliette Biao Kudenokpu, uh, Director of the United Nations Forum on Forest Secretariat. Madame Kudenokpu was uh, appointed by the UN Secretary General as Director of the UN Forest, uh, Forum on Forest Secretariat this year in January, and you joined the UNFFS from the UN Environment Programme in Nairobi. You served for over six years as director and regional representative for Africa. So please, I would like you to come up on stage and um, to kindly provide us with your main takeaway from today's event and give us your conclusion on how the increased sustainable use of wood and non-wood forest products can contribute to establishing pathways to carbon neutral and resilient bioeconomies. Thank you. You can either go from here or from the podium. It's up to you. Yes, you can do it from the podium. Okay, thank you. Everywhere. Is it too bright? The, the light. I don't know ah, where to see. Okay, yes, okay, then if you want to. Is it okay here? Yeah. Yes, okay. Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. To be honest, I was shaking when I was coming to this podium because after listening to this rich discussion from the distinguished panelists, you will agree with me that uh, it is really hard to summarize. Yes. But uh, really, I beg your indulgence. Yeah. Um, much has already been said um, about uh, the, the significance of the wood and non-wood product for the livelihood of people and for sustainable economic development in countries. The finding uh, from the Global Forest Industry Outlook that was launched uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, this event and the presentation by the distinguished panelists also highlights the importance of wood and non-wood product uh, for sustainable economy in, in, uh, in countries around the world, being for industrial needs or for energy needs, I think uh, this importance has already been highlighted. And we also heard from uh, the distinguished uh, um, uh, panelists that many countries and regions are highly dependent on wood and non-wood product to provide the basic need for the people as part of the effort to fight poverty and inequality. We also know that at the global level, conflict, disasters, outbreak of pandemic, as well as increased commodity trans uh, uh, transport and, and prices, inflation, unemployment, interruption in supply chain, has put unprecedented pressure on countries and their natural resources. We've heard that uh, uh, the recommendation about national and international decision-making bodies and officials that need to carefully devise policies and approaches to effectively respond to expectations. And we've also heard some of the key policies that need to be put in place, including education, which was put high at the last uh, UN General Assembly. 
Um, we heard about certification, which is an important tool yeah, for ensuring sustainable consumption and production. To strike a balance between supply and demand while maintaining sustainability of our limited forest resources, innovation, we need innovation, we need technology, and we need to increase efficiency in using of our wood and non-wood product. As stated in the Global uh, Forest Outlook 2050, it is imperative to also enhance productivity, increase investment, and uh, train labor force. Lastly, uh, we need to sustainably increase forest cover in line with the uh, Global Forest uh, uh, Goal 1 of the United Nations Strategic Plan on Forest. We've heard from Mr. Shell Huber, who suggests that we need to support carbon neutrality by planting 500 billion trees. Expansion of forest cover, and I finish with that, yes. through reforestation, afforestation, plantation, conservation of uh, 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 natural forests, will ensure that our forests deliver vital services and products in the long run and in a sustainable manner. Policies should be set in place to turn forests and the forest sector as one of the main components of a green, secular economy. I thank you. I like the way you ended that. Well, green. <laughs> and you looked in my face, circular. And you looked at me, economy. Jo just, like, okay. jo just to assure you that <laughs> no, 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 no. the end. <laughs> As we say in Ghana, you have surely landed. <laughs> you know what you say, you let him land. Madam Biao, thank you very much yeah. indeed. You said it was going to be a challenge to summarize, yeah. Yeah. but yes, you delivered. Thank you very much to the whole panel. So, Madam Eluafi, thank you very much to Professor Shilan Huber, um, Ramishta, oh, Ramishta wasn't here. Um, um, Hervé, merci, monsieur. Hervé, uh, Maidu, Ross Hampton, Potiso Sola, M Professor Janaina, uh, Sham, Sakuru, and Madam Kudunukpo. Thank you very much indeed, and you are wonderful. Sorry we couldn't, sorry we couldn't take your questions, but I think you agree we did do hopefully justice to the subject and we'll send you away with more information and hopefully with more energy for the rest of the day for the other sessions both plenary and side events thank you very much indeed and see you later this afternoon thank you thank you thank you yeah